All right, well, welcome to the Sports Guys, another edition of Weekend Update, another fantastic weekend in sports. How are you doing, Ravi? Doing great, thanks. What were your favorite stories coming out of the weekend? Any, any big ones that hit you? Oh, wow. I think the Commanders. Mm -hmm. Commanders was good. You know why that was so good? To, to follow up that incredible game he had against the Bengals, everyone thought he was going to have a flop game the next day. Matter of fact, all the pundits were picking the Cardinals. And he didn't just beat them in Arizona, but blew them out, blew them off the field. A real pretty good defense. You know what else I'm going to say is the Thursday night game kind of sets the tone for the weekend, I think. And when that's a good game that you can watch and not yeah. some trash game with people don't care about, Fresno State Tech or something, whatever, mm -hmm. that, that game really sets you into the weekend nicely. And then mm -hmm. you have this incredible game that you're talking about all Friday. And then you go into Saturday with all these great matchups since realignment. It seems like. And of course, then Friday night we had Miami, Virginia Tech, which we'll get into a little later. But what a great yeah. game that was. Yeah. No, that's right. So, you know, I, I just feel like there's so much good football these days. And it starts earlier in the week and just carries you through the uh, the whole weekend. And then. You know, Monday hits and you're still going. So this is so good. It literally gets better and better. And I'm talking both college and NFL. I mean, every week gets better and better. I was sitting yesterday in the Carolina Steel Sports Bar with our friend Jeff Reed and our friend Henry Peralta. And I was sitting with this huge group of Steelers fans, and we were watching the Steelers, unfortunately, lose to the Colts. But then I was watching my Panthers play the Bengals, and we were watching, you know, the Falcons win on a last-second field goal by Koo and it is just crazy. Like all, all the games come down to the last, you know, possession or two and uh, college games too. Fantastic college games, the whole slate. Oh so it's yeah. Been, it's super more fun. Than, this year. More I, than I you can even take in sometimes. <laughs> yeah. I don't even remember a season that's been this good on both sides. Um, it's just, uh, I don't know. I guess there's more parity in both leagues, I guess. Yeah. You know well, what else is cool? NIL is helping college football. It's keeping kids to their fourth, fifth year. Some of them are going to their sixth season because they're redshirting themselves so they can stay longer and get more NIL because they're not sure about NFL. Um, it's making college football better, I think. And the 12-team playoff also helps a lot because you have those twelve team group playoff. of five schools that never had a chance before. And now all of a sudden, yeah. you know, UNLV is sitting at 5-0. and oh, They've got a shot. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, it's exciting. There's teams like Liberty and, and all these teams dreaming of trying to get one of those spots, you know. It's the not biggest, impossible. The biggest thing for me out of the weekend was Alabama-Georgia. I think, um, you know, there would already been a couple legendary games this year already, and I think this was the best one so far. It felt like a playoff game. Uh, I won't be surprised at all if we see these two teams in the SEC championship game. Or if we see them maybe face off in the 12-team playoff. It's certainly possible. And uh, it just feels like they're going to collide again sometime this season. That was the game I was looking forward to all week. Sort of circled in my mind. This game is the one. Uh, and it didn't disappoint. I mean, it it started off like a crazy battle of, of massive uh, one-sided game and then it, it kind of it evened out and then they came back and went ahead and it was just it was a great game even though there was a lot of sloppy play but there was also some some of the best highlights i've ever seen in a college game also so it was, it was kind of everything the kitchen sink I, I was impressed that georgia was able to come back in the second half after getting absolutely blown out in the first yep. half we'll get into all the details and stats but Yep. Uh, I, I do think that uh, Carson Beck hurt himself in that game, and he's hurt mm -hmm. himself about three weeks in a row. It's it's looking like, to me, he's not a first-round pick uh, like mm -hmm. they thought he was. No, I think I people think are saying now he's, he's probably third-round pick. Third or fourth. He's kind of a developmental pick. He'd be the kind of pick that may go to a good team, and they can develop him for two years Yeah. Uh, with a with a kind of older quarterback, maybe like the Jets or something. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, you know, Milro has done nothing but just rise, rise, rise the whole season. Nobody really thought he could pass very much until this year. He's he's an incredible athlete. <clears throat> he is. Saban said it. They said, you don't understand how quick he is. And he's just 
You can't quite. He's faster than all the re wide receivers and running backs on the whole squad. He's yeah. the fastest guy on the team. I don't know about on the team, but I know he's faster than any offensive player. Yeah. And that's, that's right. incredible for an Alabama team that's loaded with five stars. That's true. We had some epic NFL games we'll go over too. It's just uh, mm -hmm. just fantastic weekend. Every time I think we have the best weekend yet, it, it just gets better the next weekend. So can't wait to see what's coming up. Yeah. Let's take a look at our update. Let's go. So this is our weekend update from September 30, 2024. I can't believe, Robbie, we're almost to October. Pretty incredible. You Flying see an epic by. picture there of Ryan Williams, the unbelievable receiver. He might have been the standout star in that game. I thought it would yeah. be Milrow, but this kid is 17 years old. <laughs> he just absolutely dominated with two touchdowns, 190 yards receiving. He just couldn't be stopped. I that one he had was was one of the best college plays I've ever seen in my life. It was just astounding. So Caught Alabama, it, Georgia, around, and then Alabama, he Georgia in Tuscaloosa, forward, and he stopped and right. spun around again and faked them all out. It was unreal. So was this the best game of the year? Do you think? So far? no, because there was so much sloppy play in there, but mm -hmm. it was probably the best matchup of the year. Mm -hmm. There was the some great football, though. There was sloppiness. Most talent on the field at one time. <laughs> if you really look at the highlights, some of the replays from this game yeah. are just mind-boggling, <laughs> especially on the yeah. Alabama side. So really interesting stat here. Georgia is 45-3 and three since 2021, all yep. three losses to Alabama. Yep. So he's lost to both of these coaches. Of course, he's beaten them, too, but. Uh, so 45 and three with three losses to Alabama. Of course, Jalen Milrow continues his rise. Uh, had some of the most eye popping runs I've seen mm -hmm. since, like, you know, Lamar Jackson or Michael Vick. You know, he has that kind of running talent. We didn't know if yeah. he could throw until this year. And now he's throwing, you know, 60 yard dimes. Let That's me put really it to you this way they're 48 and 0 against the rest of the country, except for the Alabama games. And they're 1 and 3 against Alabama. Right. But they're 48 0 in all the other games. So, like, they can't be touched. How much do you think it helped Alabama to be at home in Tuscaloosa to get that big 28 0 lead? Do you think that was part of it? Do you think Georgia was nervous? I wouldn't yeah, I think, think they'd be nervous. I think somehow but... Beck, Beck got rattled and it, it really his, it reverberated through his whole team that he had that lost look in his eyes for a second and they started throwing picks. Uh, and then the wheels came off, and I was, it showed me a lot, though. Georgia came back. Yeah, that like, was good. Against a really, really good Alabama team that's steamrolling you. Mm -hmm. Instead of folding up the tent and going home, they actually got the lead in the second half for a short, short period of time. Mm -hmm. They put up quite a fight. That tells you a lot about the leaders on the field. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah, I think Georgia made better adjustments at halftime. I mean, they just looked absolutely lost in the first half. Well, you could tell they started to put a spy on Milrow. That was absolutely essential. And that that gave the other teams out there a little bit of a blueprint. Yeah, but the other teams don't have Georgia's talent. <laughs> well, right, right. So but I, don't I think if they played Milrow. again, I think if they played again, Georgia would do better because they would um, know how to mitigate some of Milrow. I don't think it's an if. I think it's when. Are they going to play in the – SEC championship game, or are they going to play in the Most likely. Team playoff? <laughs> maybe both. Or maybe both, yeah. Because I don't think if if one of them loses in the in the SEC championship game, I don't think they're automatically out of the tournament. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. What did you think of this kid, Ryan Williams? I mean, have you seen a talent like that in a long time? Coming I've right never out, seen he's, anything he's... like that where a player is so dominant and he's only 17 years old. Right. I've never seen anything like he that. Just, he just popped off the screen. He you couldn't just, keep your eyes off him, literally. Yeah. And that's against Georgia's defense. <laughs> I know. <laughs> who, who, who probably have a better defense than Alabama, you know? Yeah, that's right. Oof. I did feel like Alabama was a little bit better. It just I did too. Better. Yeah. I thought they were, they were winning at the line of scrimmage. I was surprised to see Georgia's um, – Georgia's defensive line get pushed around just a little bit, not not significantly, but just a tiny bit. And then 
all the big plays were Alabama in the beginning, but mm-hmm. Georgia really had a good second and half and really made it a game. Mm-hmm. That's right. You know, they had 16 million people watch this game on a Saturday night. It was a good one. <laughs> That's incredible. So I'm trying to think if they do play again, it'll probably be like 25 million who watch it. Yeah. <laughs> the whole country's going to want to watch the rematch. Yeah. I hope a lot of our, our, our viewers out there got to see this game because it was, it was full of what's in the future in the NFL coming up. <laughs> Both sides with just yeah like the whole lines are going to be pros. Yeah, everybody. It was really enjoyable. I thought it was a great game. Uh, tale of two halves. Uh, Alabama, I thought, was a little bit better. But, um, you know, these are two of the top four teams in the country for sure. I just right, can't to... believe that Georgia could come back like that. Like I know. It was impressive. It was. Carson they were getting kinda, smacked. Carson Beck kind of settled down a little bit, which is good to see. Yeah. And, uh, the, the, the talent kind of set in. <laughs> So the next game we want to talk about is, was the night before, Friday night, and it was kind of the uh, national game of the week on Friday night, which was Miami beating Virginia Tech. And Virginia Tech fans and a lot of football fans believe that this Hail Mary, Hail Mary actually worked, that this Hail Mary actually worked at the end, and that Virginia Tech won the game on this Hail Mary. Um, Miami fans, of course, and many others think that the ball hit the ground and that it was not a catch. Um, they had, uh, I guess it was a three and a half minute, um, shoving match and, uh, review over this play. So eventually came out and nullified Virginia Tech's touchdown and gave it to Miami. What what were your thoughts here? Hmm. Well, both teams jumped up immediately and celebrated, which, speaks to the fact that they they really genuinely both thought that they had won. Um, I think it was difficult. The angles that I saw made it difficult to see what happened. So in that way, it's kind of hard for me to understand. Um, It's hard for me to understand how they overruled the call on the field. However, I saw still shots that made it definitely look like Virginia Tech never controlled it. So I honestly don't know on this one. This wasn't one I have a big opinion on. Well, here's the deal. If you read the rest of this paragraph, there was no clear visual of the ball amid a massive humanity. That's the problem. I mean, when the right. refs can't see it, and also when you go to the videotape, you can't see it. Yeah. And nearly – Then you, then you would year, think you'd have to stay with the call on the field. And after nearly 30 seconds of shoving, swatting, and struggling, 30 seconds yeah. the pile was yeah. going. A Miami defender comes away with the ball and runs to midfield in celebration with the ball in his hands. Right. Acting, acting as if he picked it. And um, then an official just out of nowhere signals touchdown. And everyone was just flabbergasted. Like, what the heck? I actually watched this play again about an hour ago just to kind of watch it again. And it, it was just so confusing. I don't know how they ended yeah. up coming up with the decision here. I don't know. And And the game hinges on it, you know, so – I usually have an opinion on these things. I usually feel like either the refs got it right and a losing team is just being bad sports or, wow, somebody got robbed here. I have no idea. I don't know. I, I can't how, tell if how the do still we know, shots I was looking at were legitimate. And how do we know if Miami didn't actually come up with it? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you don't. You it's, don't. it's a real problem. Yeah. There was so, just not a quite a good enough angle TV wise, in my opinion, to really determine how long the Virginia Tech guy held it. Did he ever really control it? I'm sure Virginia Tech fans out there would well, hopefully you guys can respond if if uh, if you feel like you know for sure what happened here, feel free to put it in the yeah. comments. I'd love to yeah. I'd love to read that because I don't know. Yeah, please drop us a comment. If you saw a camera angle from somewhere that gave you a definitive what happened on this play, if Virginia Tech controlled it, Miami con- controlled mm-hmm. it, if it hit the ground to be incomplete, you know, what was it? Because I've watched it from several angles, uh, and I still can't tell. <laughs> so I, as, a, as an ACC fan, this is good for the ACC that Miami pulled it out uh, because they're a real contender. And then uh, as a Virginia you know fan – for- and you know that's Virginia well, Tech's Virginia Tech. As the Virginia fan, I won't I won't go there, but right, right. Well, 
and, and, you know, that's Virginia Tech's fans' theory is that, you know, they wanted Miami to win this game so that they could stay in bowl contention. That's their – that was their theory, but I, I don't believe that. I don't think this was some kind of ref crew that wanted Miami or something. I just don't believe it. Yeah, this wasn't some theft of, a, of an obvious call. This was hard call, like difficult. But do I feel bad for Virginia Tech in some yeah, ways? Yes. If I, I was a fan of their – I would feel bad because they might have caught it and gotten robbed. I don't know. Yeah, that was an interesting one. So yeah, d definitely drop us a comment. Let us know what you think. Let's look at some of the big scores from the weekend. We already talked about Alabama, Georgia, forty-one thirty-four. What a game! Texas takes care of business against Mississippi State, thirty-five thirteen. They kind of struggled in the first half. It was fourteen to six at half, and everyone thought they were going to win this game by about thirty. So it was kind of their first semi-subpar game, even though they did take care of business. Um, Arch Manning had uh, two passing touchdowns and one running touchdown, and he had two interceptions, his first in college. So um, that was part of the reason why they didn't roll the score up a little bigger. Any thoughts on Texas? Um, not really. I think um, Arch Manning's going to have some growing pains, even at this college level. He's not really the starter yet. He's filling in. Everyone's rallying around him, but uh, he's going to make some errors. He's he's starting to see some some blitz packages and stuff that he hasn't seen yet. So he's doing great for his second game. Uh, Three hundred twenty-four yards, nothing to sneeze at. Um, maybe for a Manning, that's not that great, but uh, you know, I think they're just steamrolling people, and they're they're going to be really hard to beat, except for those top four teams. The other thing we have to realize is they've entered the, a new conference, and that's the SEC, and this was their first SEC win. I don't know if there was some jitters around that. It was at Texas. It was at Austin, so shouldn't have been too many jitters, but you know, certainly it's significant that that was their first SEC win. Yeah, and Mississippi State isn't that great this year, so you know, Texas I mean, should have is, They really should have beaten them by more. Oh, that's the reality. They had a yeah. little bit of a subpar mm -hmm. offensive day. You just can't you just can't win every game by a huge blowout every every time. Things can go wrong. Sometimes you have a little bit of an injury of some kind of a leader on the field that really disheartens your team. Um, you, you just not every not every game's a blowout even even when it probably should be some of the time. So Texas is fine. Yeah, I agree. So they uh, actually dropped to two uh, because of the subpar game and of course they gave Alabama the the nod at one. We talked about Miami, Virginia Tech. Miami, of course, this was huge for them. It was their first ACC win and also kept them 5-0 and and on track for the playoff, which is what everyone thinks they're going to get at the end of the year. Uh, we talked about that game. Ohio State takes care of business, 38-7. to Had a really solid first half, kind of cruised into the end there. Could have made it a bigger blowout, but actually ended up subbing in some second stringers in the fourth quarter to give them some playing time. Michigan State's just not that good this year. Any thoughts here? Um, Ohio State, in my opinion, is a top three team. They have probably the best roster in football, but definitely top three rosters. So, you know, Michigan State's just not going to match up against that. I agreed. Absolutely agreed. Next game's interesting. It was actually at Ole Miss. Ole Miss was 4-0 and going into this game. Has the uh, first-round pick quarterback that – uh, everyone really likes, and even though Kentucky's been very good, everyone assumed that Ole Miss would find a way to get this done and, and did not. Kentucky scored a very late touchdown to snatch this victory away from Ole Miss, 20-17 to 17 on the road. Any thoughts about Kentucky and how they continue to impress? I think Ole Miss uh, has a great running game, and they were number six in the country. I think Kentucky, though, is, is more dangerous than usual. And I think even though they have a couple of disappointing games, they can play with the big boys. So, I mean, they really should have beaten Georgia. <laughs> they're so. kind of, yeah, they're kind of upset specialists at this point. <laughs> you just don't want to really play Kentucky because they'll, they'll make you have a bad day. Mm -hmm, that's right. It looks like Kentucky's defense is very, very good. Yeah. They're, they're holding everybody below their point averages. That was a solid game there. Oregon takes care of business, uh, gets their first win in the Big Ten. Now they're 4-0. Uh, they've been rising and rising. They started at 21. They're already up to eight. 
think they'll be a yeah, little higher this week. Their first couple of games were were kind of disappointing in their in their yeah. results, even though mm -hmm. they're they're undefeated. Um, they weren't impressive t first two wins. Think of those as preseason games, uh, where you you don't really have much practice before the season starts, and you kind of get thrown in. And it seems like they're clicking on all cylinders now. They're really starting mm -hmm. to beat some teams um, pretty dramatically. We talked about one of the reasons they were disappointed in the first two weeks is because Gabriel hadn't played very well, but everyone knew Gabriel's a great quarterback and that he's going yeah. to come on. Them. Yeah, and he so had now... three touchdowns and 278 yards in this game, so he he yeah. looks like, you know, the guy. That's right. Yeah, he's starting to come and, on. And, oh, and they, they had offensive line um, injuries in the first two weeks, and mm -hmm. those have gotten fixed and, and straightened out, so – Mm -hmm. They're they're just they're right outside that top group. Mm -hmm. That's right, in my opinion. Another huge matchup in the Big Ten: Illinois comes in four and zero, plays Penn State at Penn State, and uh, this is kind of a, a slug it out running game. Both teams running a lot, very low scoring. Uh, Penn State ends up getting two touchdowns in the second half to win it. What are your thoughts on this uh, Big Ten low scoring matchup? Uh, Penn State's D was impressive. I mean they they held uh, they held Altmeyer to 185 yards and a touchdown, mm -hmm. and uh, that's pretty good. It's pretty good stuff. Yeah, there was a lot of people saying upset special here. Although Penn State was ranked higher, uh, I I didn't really think Illinois can beat them at Penn State. I think if it was at Illinois, maybe. I uh, thought they had a shot, um, but I, you know, after seeing kind of what happened, mm, Penn State would beat them most of the time. Agreed. Next game was a huge upset in the Big 12. Uh, everyone considers Utah as the probable Big 12 playoff entrant. Uh, of course, they had made it all the way up to number 10. Uh, very highly ranked. They got a great quarterback, got a great defense. They can run the ball. Uh, everyone knew Arizona was very good this year. Of course, they have that fantastic receiver that we highlighted a couple weeks ago. But um, no one really thought they could go into Utah and, and do this upset, and they did. And then they actually controlled the game from beginning to end. Utah yeah. got kind of a trash touchdown in the fourth quarter, but for the most part, this was a pretty dominating win by Arizona. What are your thoughts on this one? I think it was the most surprising game of the weekend. Uh, I, I thought Utah was going to handle them and because they have their sights on, on a big prize of getting in. They're trying to get – into the tournament by getting a buy. And right. uh, I don't know. I don't think Utah's going to get in if they don't win their conference. No, I agree with that. I but we'll see. That. You know, we'll see. Whoever wins the Big 12 will be will get a buy because the top four yeah. conferences get a buy. So they still could get a buy even with this loss. Yeah, they could. The only way though is if they win the conference. Yeah, that's right. So the next game uh was a little surprising. Michigan continues their comeback after their big loss to Texas. Um, playing a really tough Minnesota team in a Big Ten matchup. It was at the Big House in Ann Arbor, which helps them. And uh, they continue to improve and prove that they uh, they can get this thing done. They almost gave this game up in the fourth quarter. If Minnesota had one more possession, might be not, might have been able to take the game. But Michigan gets it done. Didn't surprise me at all. I knew it would be a good game, and I felt like Michigan would win. So – you know, you're just kind of taking care of business in an okay way. It's Running the ball, 250 yards rushing. Don't pass I don't really have any that. notes next to that one. It's just, to me, it just was a meh, you know. They had 114 um, yards passing, so more than last time, yeah. but not much. And then about 250 yards rushing. So they're, they're basically a running team. With yeah, good defense. they're running. Their quarterback yeah. play is, is, is decent, but not great. And they have a lot of power on – their offensive defensive lines and they have a lot of strengths for their team and they the top teams could exploit some of their weaknesses so any concern that they almost gave this game up or is it just that Minnesota's pretty good Minnesota's a good team um I think it is concerning that you almost give up a game when you're a running team <clears throat> I think you should be able to run the clock out and and pound the other team into submission but mm -hmm. Uh, you know, also, I don't think Minnesota is going to bring out your your best game of the year either, usually. So, 
no, right. no, no worries. Michigan just moves on, <clears throat> take care of business, trying to, trying to stay alive toward that, toward the, um, toward the playoff. So next game, USC got their first Big Ten win. Of course, their first Big Ten loss was last week. So the first Big Ten win, they were down 21-10 to 10 at halftime to Wisconsin. Everybody was kind of shocked when they saw the score line. Then they shut out Wisconsin in the second half, and they score four touchdowns and win going away. So clearly, mm-hmm. you know, over the long term of the game, they were the better team. Yep, but nice they, halftime adjustments, a little regroup. Yep. Get the offense going. Very talented team. Um, you know, beating LSU. This, and This score is kind of what I was expecting from this game. If I would have chosen to be somewhere in this range, I just didn't think they'd go down 21 to 10 at halftime at home. <laughs> yeah, I agree. That That's a strange result at halftime, but, you know, the good teams will find a way forward and wear the other team out eventually. You think USA can still work their way back into the playoff? Yeah. Yeah, they're right on the verge. All they need is a little bit of help from some teams that might fall off ahead of them. There's a few up there that that don't look so dominating. So it feels to me like whoever wins the USC Notre Dame game is going to go, and whoever loses that game is not going to go. That's what it feels like to me. Very, very well could be. be. Huge game. <clears throat> yeah. So next game we got South Alabama two weeks ago. They scored 87 points. Then they ran up against LSU's defense <laughs> in in Death Valley, Louisiana, and uh, yeah. it was just a beat down from beginning to end, forty two to ten. Not close. Um, you know, I just these, these are the kind of games. I know why they play them. I know why LSU pays them two million to play them, but I just have to wonder. You know, they're really in two different divisions. <laughs> there haven't been that many of those games this year. No, not very many. You this know what I mean? Like this was one of them. This. The talent really showed up in this yep. one. Next game was one of the games of the week, I thought. And you called this. You said you thought it would be a really great game, and it was. Mm-hmm. And Louisville almost pulled it out at the end. They really were coming on. Notre Dame, Louisville. Notre Dame gets a big lead at halftime um, and then kind of holds on for dear life at the end. Uh, this was at Notre Dame. Keeps them on track for their comeback after their upset loss. Uh, Louisville's first loss of the season. Any thoughts? Just uh, show is it his name? Show. Yeah. Show uh, was he? He had three hundred six. Uh, sorry, three touchdowns and two hundred sixty four yards. And that's a pretty nice team. I, I don't remember Louisville being this good for a while. Mm-hmm. But uh, I know they've had some good quarterbacks come out of there. But <clears throat> they they seem like a really solid ACC team. And, and Riley think, Leonard had a nice day. I mean, uh, he he'd had yeah. a couple struggle weeks in a row, but he had a nice day on Saturday. Yeah. It was good to see. And then Notre like- Dame has all that talent. So it's that was a good game. That was one that you circle on, on the calendar. For sure. <laughs> solid ACC matchup. Really shows ACC in really good light when you get those kind of great matchups. Mm-hmm. Next one was uh, the new ACC entrant, Stanford, who had just upset Syracuse, uh, comes into Clemson, Death Valley, the other Death Valley, and um, gets boat raced. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Clemson kind of controlled from beginning to end here. Uh, Club Nick played well. They ran the ball well. Any surprises with this one? Not at all. I think Clemson's back. Uh, I don't think they can compete in that top six teams in, in the country. But I, I think agree. below that, they could beat any one of them. Uh, I think they're a very, very good team. They've sort of re- recovered from some stumbles. Uh, I think 17 is low for them. I think they should be a little higher. To me, they're somewhere between 10 and 15. Mm-hmm. So they should be right on the edge of, of the playoff. Completely agree. And I wouldn't be surprised if they win the ACC and and – Go to, go to the playoffs. So. I wouldn't be surprised if Clemson makes the playoff at all, the way yeah. they're rolling, where they're rolling right now. If I had to put money down, I'd say Miami's going to win the ACC. But if I, if I, if I could not pick them, I'd say Clemson would probably do it. Mm-hmm. Be one of those two. Next game is a Big Twelve matchup. These are the other two teams in the Big Twelve picture. So you got Arizona is in the Big Twelve picture. You got, of course, Utah, who's leading. 
you have Oklahoma State and Kansas State are the other two. So out of those four, one of them is going to win the Big 12. Mm-hmm. Uh, Kansas State's actually well, really well positioned after this victory. They kind of beat down Oklahoma State, which is kind of a surprise, 42 to 20. And um, Oklahoma State had been a little bit higher ranked, but um, Kansas State actually is in really nice position now if Utah has another stumble. Yeah. To maybe, maybe pick up the Big 12. So it'll be interesting to watch. Any thoughts on that game? Just a solid top 25 matchup. Kansas State took care of business. They probably need to go higher. Just a really good college matchup that I keep talking about is these matchups they have this year are really good. I know. There's, I just, not, a, never seen. <clears throat> there's not a lot of these blowout South Alabama against LSU matchups. You know, there's not very never, many of them. Never seen a schedule like this. It just did such a great job this year. Yeah, I love it. It's It's so good. It's so good for the fans because even the middle tier teams are playing a lot of middle tier teams. And so they're great games. You know, you get like you get Virginia Tech, Miami, then you get, you know, Alabama, Georgia, then you get, you know, Michigan, Minnesota, then you get Arizona, Utah. It's just game after game after game. LSU, Notre Dame. I love it. Oklahoma State, Kansas State. Yeah. Really good matchups. Kentucky, Ole Miss. Like, yeah. It's fantastic. And then every once in a while you get an LSU and an Ohio State that just, you know, <laughs> take the team behind the Destroy, woodshed. Destroy, yeah. <laughs> every now and then you get a bad one, but there's not that many of them this year. And actually, I wouldn't think Ohio State, Michigan State, when they scheduled this, mm-hmm. wouldn't have looked like as lopsided as, as, it, as it ended up being. Completely agree. Because <clears throat> it's well, too I'm good excited, program. Really excited about this weekend slate. It just gets better and better in this season. Yeah, I know. I think it's even good. more, even better. So Virginia's got Boston College. That'll be fun to watch. Yep. So the AP Top 25 has been completely scrambled again by this past weekend. You now have Alabama that leapfrogged from four to one. Texas stayed at two with their semi-unimpressive win. Ohio State still at three, stays the same. Uh, Tennessee moves up into the four slot, and Georgia drops to five from number two. And you got what rounds out the ten, top 10. You got Oregon, Penn State, Miami keeps rising, Missouri, and then Michigan goes all the way from 18 to 10. I, I was really surprised by that leap. Mm-hmm. And you can see the rest of the 11 through 25 there. Lots of big names. Any surprises with this kind of top 10 ranking? No. I think Clemson could go a little higher. I think um... – I wouldn't have switched Tennessee and Georgia. I would have kept Georgia at four, but anytime you have a loss, I can understand. You got to earn it back. Um, pretty good top 25 this week. I think it's close to the talent levels of each team. I think Clemson K- will keep rising. K- I think State Notre might Dame go up. Will, yeah, K State will go up. I think Notre Dame will rise. Yeah. We'll keep rising. Um, you'll see, you see Indiana in there. They're at five and oh. Yeah. They finally into the top 25. Um, I could see Utah down a little. I could see them missing the tournament if they don't win their division. Mm -hmm. That's right. It'll be really fascinating to see how this changes every week with all the upsets and all the big games. Yeah. As we track it. So winners of the week, we got Alabama, of course, with their huge win, probably the biggest matchup of the year so far. Michigan riding them the ship and kind of bringing themselves back. SC with a huge win. Clemson, like you said, feels like they're back after their disappointing opening week, although it was against Georgia. Notre Dame has also righted the ship after their mega upset. And you have some losers here. Ole Miss was really having dreams of big things this year, and then they had this really bad loss at home. Wisconsin uh, was also very upset-minded but couldn't get it done. Uh, Georgia, of course, with the loss, but um, you know nobody thinks that they're out of it. They're still in very good position. And then Louisville, who um, everybody was wondering if they could possibly beat a team like Notre Dame and didn't get it done. Any thoughts on these? I would add Carolina, the loser of the week. How in the world they lost the game to Duke, I'll never understand. I don't know. I, I wrote it off. It was 20 to 14 with like 50 seconds left or something. I don't know. And they figured out. How do you lose that game? It's crazy. Do you think Mac is in trouble? No, because he has so much history there and and he's so good for recruiting. But they keep asking him in in the press conferences and they're real tense. 
uh, the reporters ask, are you thinking about stepping down? Like this, this is where his program is. is they're asking him if he's going to resign. And he always says no, but whew, well, he's giving up 70, 70 points to JMU. I, mean, I know. How many weeks can you have these disappointing losses and say, I'm not going anywhere? At some point, alumni start saying, yeah, you are. I'm going to pay your 50 million buyout and uh, get you mm -hmm. out of town. Mm hmm. I'm not saying we're at that point, but I'm just saying he better. I agree better. with you. I, I think if they part ways with him, it'll be at the end of the year. They won't do it midseason or anything. Yeah, no, he's earned the right to mm -hmm. go out and say that he's stepping down. He's much know, beloved that, in Carolina, but I, yeah. the way they played this year is very concerning. I, I don't know why. They have so much talent. They always get good talent. It seems like they have some weaknesses, though, that are, that are being exploited by other teams. Mm-hmm. JMU scoring 70 on them, that, that can't happen. Crazy. I know. Well, let's go take a look at the NFL. And uh, I want to ask you the question, which is the best story in the NFL this year? Is it Sam Darnold? And you look at his stats here in his first four games, 20 for 28 against Green Bay this past weekend, 275. Virtually a perfect game with three touchdowns, one interception. Uh, beats, beat down Houston 34 to 7. Had almost a perfect game with four touchdown passes. Uh, was crushing San Francisco. They did make a little comeback in the second half, but they had that game easily in hand. Same thing, really solid game. And then, uh, of course, against New York, blew them out as well. Um, nobody had any idea that Sam Darnold could play like this. I mean, he was with my Carolina Panthers. He was okay. I think he was three and nine or something for us. So that's his uh, season so far. And then Jaden Daniels, of course, uh, no one saw this coming either. Total beatdown of the Arizona Cardinals at their home, 42-14. to 14. The huge win on national TV against Cincinnati, 38-33, where he had essentially the perfect game. Um, beat the New York Giants. Uh, they had seven field goals in that game. <laughs> and then had one loss, which is the beginning of the season, against Tampa Bay, but still played very well. What are your thoughts about what is the better story here? So I grew up a Redskin fan. And so there's a real special thing going on in Washington. Uh, the commanders have a really special young quarterback who I hope that the uh, expectations are not getting too high because he's still going to struggle at times. But it's it's the most impressive rookie quarterback play I can I can think of through four games. Um, however, I think the most dramatic story is Sam Darnold. Uh, I think that he has been tossed away by the Jets as a bust. He was not particularly successful in Carolina. He went out and was back up in San Fran and allowed to walk out the door over money. And he gets there to Minnesota and he blossoms. And it's just so incredible. And I know he gives a lot of credit to his time in San Francisco learning. Tell, tell the story about that, about how he kind of learned under a younger quarterback, which is yeah. Brock. Yeah, well, so I think he never really had a mentor veteran before because he, he got to San Francisco and the special relationship between Purdy – and Shanahan, he was mentally taking a lot of notes watching Purdy, who came in as Mr. Irrelevant, had no reason to believe that he was going to blossom or, or even get to ever see the field. Uh, but he worked hard, and his goal was to become the starter or, or something. And so the way he prepared changed Darnold. Darnold watched this preparation – of how he was watching film and working out and just total buy-in. He watched his junior quarterback, somebody younger than him, acting like the veteran, teaching him how to prepare, mentally, physically, uh, prepare for all the game film you're supposed to watch. And he said it changed his life. It changed his life to watch this rookie quarterback, Mr. Irrelevant, who's not supposed to be successful. He was the first round pick, not Purdy. And Purdy was acting like the grizzled veteran. And so Darnold said that 
It changed his entire life because it changed how he looks at football, how he approaches football. And he got to watch that coach player interaction where they could bounce ideas off each other. And it was a more collaborative effort than what he had seen to that point. It speaks highly really of the San Francisco organization of how they have a culture there of success and, and, and winning mindset and, there's no excuses. Well, I'm just Mr. Relevant. I'm just going to collect a paycheck and, and sit on the bench. No, I want to become the starter. It's and an so, incredible story. He goes from yeah. no support in New York for several years. Yep. Okay. We know how abysmal the Jets organization and their offensive coaching is. He goes from that to the Carolina Panthers, where he has just as an abysmal situation, my team, unfortunately. Terrible. Um, he finally goes to a real organization, the 49ers, who do things the right way, who have a great offensive coaching staff, who had Brock Purdy on the roster. He's been playing great. And he gets real coaching and real ability to train and get ready for this situation. Mm -hmm. So it is an incredible story. The fact that he's able yeah. to come essentially midway through his career and resurrect it in Minnesota and play this well. And now they're saying he's one of the favorites, if not the favorite, for league MVP. So if yep. that's not amazing, I don't – I mean, he's not going to win it, I don't think. But just to be in the conversation is I, one of the coolest stories I can remember in football. I totally understand why you say that that's the better story. I'm going to have to disagree, and I'm going to go towards Jaden Daniels by about 1% or 2%. And the reason is you and I have made a theory, and we believe it strongly, that you shouldn't play rookie quarterbacks. Yep. And the reason is, is they're not ready. They're just right. not ready. And, the, and we had one exception maybe in the last 10 years, and that was C.J. Stroud last year. Mm -hmm. And he, in his first four games, he looked pretty bad. I mean, he, people were starting to question him, but then he came on at the end of the year and really learned how to play the position. This guy's doing it from the very beginning. He didn't yeah. even need that ramp up. And he's doing things that no one's ever done before as a rookie. It's just like once-in-a-lifetime kind of deal. And anybody, any quarterback who has Washington, a long-suffering franchise for about 30 years, at 3-1 and one and leading the NFC East as a rookie and playing this well, I, I just have to give him a little bit of a lean. But I certainly understand why you say to Sam Darnold. And that's why I put these two on the same page, because really, to me, they're the two best stories in the NFL this year. You know, you put this slide together, and we kind of went around about it a little bit, back and forth with our ideas. And then we said, let's face it, both of these stories are pretty incredible. And that's true. I mean, that's just the truth. It, they both tell a different um, amazing story of a veteran who was thrown away like trash and then a rookie who comes in and defies all the odds. Very cool stories. Um, you have a redemption story in Sam Darnold, okay? His fourth stop in the league. Yeah. Finally, finally gets a chance and finally plays like this. And then you have a guy who really probably shouldn't be playing, but – was so ready for the NFL, so prototypically ready because of his training in the SEC. Mm -hmm. It's just tearing the league up. I mean, I watched both of these guys' uh, highlights and the way they both throw the ball. Jaden yeah. Daniels is doing stuff that Mahomes does now, like sidearming it and like yeah. flicking it and juking guys out. It, it's amazing. And Jaden Daniels is almost as fast as, as Jalen Milrow. <laughs> no, no. When he it's hard to believe he's a rookie, the way he's playing. But – this is through four games. That's a tiny body of work. True. It's a legitimate body of work, but it's tiny. And so, and that's true for Darnold as well. Um, but league MVP talk for Darnold just blows my mind. Mm -hmm. And to think that teams were literally throwing him away like trash, and now he's no, it's, a it's very, amazing. very good starter, if not, you know, playing some of the best in the league. Um, there's a couple of veterans like this right now that are, that are cool. Uh, but this, you know, Darnold, it's, I think it's the best story that I've come across this year, but which they're both. Of guys, which of these two guys, if they were hurt tomorrow and out for the season would hurt their team more? Probably Darnold because they would have to go into their third string. <laughs> I say Daniels because the Vikings have a much better defense than the, than the commanders do. They have maybe the best defense in football, or maybe the second best. Yeah. After the Kansas City Chiefs. And so they they could lean on their running game with Aaron Jones. They could lean on their defense. 
as long as someone gets them, you know, a little bit of production at the quarterback position. Yeah, I you think, might have a point there. I'm not I sure. Think Daniels goes out. I think Washington goes back to, you know. I think any time you're starting a rookie, though, you know that things could go south and you have to have a backup plan. And True. the fact that J.J. McCarthy is out hurt, I think if Darnold goes down, I don't even know who their third string quarterback is. True. True. Well, hopefully neither one of those happens and they both continue. Yeah, to- it's really nice this time of year because most people are healthy. Mm-hmm. And I hope the commanders win the division. That'd be so cool. Speaking of that, that look nice. on the bottom bottom right of this slide. The highest completion percentage in a four-game span ever, Jaden Daniels, 82.1, beating Peyton Manning in 2008, the year he won an MVP, and beating Tom Brady, 79.2, a year he won the MVP, the year before that, 2007. Of course, both of them go on to Hall of Fame careers. <laughs> so you say Darnold's playing like an MVP. He is, but so is Jaden Daniels. <laughs> so yeah. we'll see. We'll see what happens. So some of the scores. And, and by the way, it's a little early for all this talk. So I put all yeah. this in context. Four games out of seventeen games is a is a small body uh, of work, but it it gives you trends. And um, Jeff Reed said it. He said, "Get me to week four, and I'll look, and you'll be able to see some trends starting, and you'll mm-hmm. you'll know what you have." So and for those of you who didn't watch our draft specials uh, some months back, go back and take a look at those because you'll see Rob and I were really crowing over this guy, Jaden Daniels. We knew he was going to be good. We knew it ahead of time. We said he might be one of the few guys who could actually start along with Bo Nix because he was, just, he was just ready. He was ready. You can't uh, underestimate how good his situation was. Um, a lot of times it's, it's not so much which quarterback is better. It's which good quarterback is going to the better situation. Well, here's and the so deal. He goes Cliff to – Cliff Kingsbury yeah. is is – an incredible coach, offensive coach. He, he's struggled a little as a head coach, but they said it's because he connects so much with his quarterback that everyone thinks of him as this genius, which he is, but he doesn't necessarily bring the disciplinarian um, and some of the pieces you need to be a head coach, but he is an incredible offensive coach. And so there's no way Jaden could have gone to a better uh, mentor because Kingsbury doesn't think of some guy he wants to create fear in and beat down and and whatever. He wants to build him up and make him believe, you know, I mean, Harbaugh does the same thing. You know, Harbaugh went to the trainer and asked Herbert, uh, could he get him the same shoes Herbert has? Cause he likes them. And he, he's wearing Herbert's shoes around the training camp, you know, or the, the, you, facility. you literally, you just hit it out of the park, Rob. And and that is that this guy goes to the right situation with Cliff mm-hmm. Kingsbury and Sam Darnold. Who does he go to? Wh- who used to be the best offensive coordinator or Donald O'Connell. Yeah. And he, you know, is one of the best in the business and he calls the plays for the Vikings. <laughs> so yeah, he, both these guys literally go to probably their best situations in their career. Yeah. They just that's not, to do that's not career. an accident or an amazing coincidence. That's what happens. Yeah, and then also Darnold has the best or the second best defense in football with Flores. <laughs> so, I mean, the Vikings have two of the best coordinators in football. Mm-hmm. So there's a reason they're 4-0. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Let's look at these scores here. We got the Bears came through with a win. They go 2-2. Two and two. They beat the really injured, banged-up Rams, who just kind of struggled all day getting field goals. Um, offense just doesn't look the same without Cooper Cup and Nakua. Uh, they weren't able to run the ball very well. Um, the Bears, I don't think, are a very good team, but they were able to pull this out in Chicago, get two touchdowns in the second half, and, uh, of course, Caleb Williams gets to celebrate his second victory. Any thoughts about the Bears beating the banged-up Rams? Um, well, I called this, and I said for that exact reason. Uh, I was looking through my picks last night, and uh, – I said that the Bears would probably beat the Rams because they're a little banged up. <laughs> so I said this is a parody game. This is a game that the worst team's not gonna is gonna win. You know, uh, out of the two, uh, the Bears have some talented players, and they have some bright spots for sure. And but they also have some problems. So I think a really good team is going to beat the Bears almost almost every week. Absolutely. But good on them to take advantage of their opportunities. When you play a banged up team, you got to take them out. 
I agree. And one thing I'll mention about Caleb, he didn't play great, but he did eliminate some of the mistakes he made the first couple of weeks. Yeah. He looks less and, like a rookie today than he did in week one where he got. As soon as you get a guy like that, who's that talented to start eliminating the mistakes, then they have a chance to win any game, basically, yep. especially, especially at home. Yep. Next game was a big NFC South battle. I believe we both chose the Saints, but it was tough. It was at Atlanta. You know, th these guys are fighting it out for. I picked the Falcons. Oh, you did? Okay. Yeah. I picked the Saints. And um, I, at the time, I would not be surprised if either team won it because <laughs> they're both just kind of, you know, th they battle each other every year, twice a year. It was a hard one. Um, the Saints should have won this game. Uh, mm -hmm. I watched a lot of it. Um, the Falcons made all kinds of mistakes. Even on the last drive, we had a 58 yard kick by Ku, his longest ever. Should have been much closer, but the Falcons kept messing up their last drive and, and calling inexplicable plays, little screens out to the left, mm -hmm. losing seven yards. And uh, Kirk Cousins took a sack, and it just it was a mess. Yeah. And yeah, the fact that they won this game, it was kind of a miracle that they won this game because they yeah. really messed up and they didn't do good clock management on the final drive, but they have an excellent kicker. As a matter of fact, I have him on my fantasy team. And, um, they were able to pull this game out in the South. What are your thoughts? Kind of an ugly game, but a, a good matchup of, of teams that generally are going to play better than that against each other. Uh, it kind of brought out the worst in each other, I guess. Um, so I think that it was uh, – I mean, this game could have gone either way. It was one of the hardest picks of the week for me. I did pick the Falcons, but I, I feel like that field goal could have missed too, so – it was, a, it was a good game. Both teams are sort of going upward and ascending in terms of skill level and talent and expectations. Um, but both have had some disappointing losses already. So it's kind of tempering the expectations a little, but both need to keep making moves to, to keep on the path of trying to win that division. It's not a very strong division. So, you know, they got to, whoever wins that division. Can, can make some noise. The uh, Both teams ran the ball really well. So you have Bijan Robinson on one side, and, of course, the Saints have a really excellent running uh, running attack, um, including when they used Taysom Hill. And uh, the Saints really could have kind of salted this game away towards the end of the game and inexplicably started passing the ball with six minutes left in the fourth quarter instead of just running the ball <laughs> and trying to run the clock out. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll just never understand sometimes why they do that. But anyway, um, bottom line is because, they really – Because when they do, the coach gets um, called um, too conservative. And so it, it's a double-edged sword. You know, uh, the fans will complain no matter what you do, I think, sometimes. But the right coach work doesn't worry about that. <laughs> they want to win the game. No, I agree. I think I yeah. think if you have the right mix of, of play calls, you can, you can kill a lot of clock and still throw when you need to make first downs. And uh, – you know, it didn't work out for the Saints. That's a, right. that's a tough loss because they could have had that one on the road. That would have been a big steal of a, of a game. That's right. The next one, the Chiefs go 4-0 and and still don't play well. Somehow they've won four games and haven't played well yet this year. Um, Chiefs lost uh, Rasheed Rice, who's probably their best receiver and the, and the number one target for Mahomes in this game. Really sad to see that, and it looks like he's got an ACL or some kind of major injury. We'll see what happens there, but um, – Bottom line for the Chiefs is every week it seems like they lose a weapon. Uh, this particular week they had to rely on Travis Kelsey, who got his uh, biggest game of the year with seven catches. Uh, Noah Gray was the backup tight end. And then, of course, they had the big touchdown to Xavier Worthy. Uh, we're able to win this game largely on defense and on running the ball behind. Um, what is his name? Hmm. Anyway, and running the ball. So, um, you know, what are your thoughts about this? Chargers score 10 points in the first and they can't score the rest of the way. And clearly Chargers has some real problems. Chargers roster is missing quite a bit. Um, they don't have a receiving core. Uh, Herbert's playing banged up. I'm not in love with their running situation. So most of their offense to me is is a B- minus or, or lower. Uh, I like Herbert a lot, but I think they they just they need a lot of offensive pieces to be honest. 
They so also I, had Bosa out of this game and Derwin James, so they had two yeah, of their Bosa's starters. Bosa's getting people. hurt every other game now, and yeah, they they just they they're having some problems. They're having a lot of injury problems, and they have some personnel issues. I think they need some more. They need one or two more drafts before they're really where Harbaugh wants them. So what are your thoughts about the Chiefs just keep winning even though they really aren't playing well and they don't have a lot of weapons this year? Or they're just kind of punchless. I mean, they're banged winning. up. Their receiving core is injured. Their running backs are injured. Um, they're just barely hanging on on offense. And so it's forcing Mahomes to throw things – and he's getting picks, you know, it, he doesn't look great. So this is probably his worst four game stretch and they're four and oh. So imagine I mean, look, when they start clicking, looking at their running game, because they've had so many injuries. They have Kareem hunt who played his yeah. first game of the year. He had 69 yards rushing. And then you had P Ryan. He used to be with the commanders, had a couple mm -hmm. rushes and had a real nice touchdown. But um, I don't know. They just keep getting it done. I, I saw an interview of Andy Reid going into the locker room. They were down 10 to seven at the time. And they asked him, what do you need to do to win this game? And he said, don't worry about it. We're going to go in the locker room and make adjustments, and we'll pull it out. And they did. <laughs> so I, I, I think it's just they're very low on personnel this year, but they have the best coaching staff in football. So they know like. that their defense will keep it close, so their offense just can't make big mistakes. And um, Reed does incredible adjustments at halftime. They ran the ball down down the Chargers' throats in the second half and just squeaked out a win. It wasn't pretty, but Chargers are banged up, so the Chiefs got their win and they move on. Right. So next game, uh, our friend Henry was really happy. Twenty to sixteen win by the Raiders over the Browns. The Browns' offense with their $55 million a year guy, Deshaun Watson, $275 million guaranteed. Biggest guaranteed contract in history, and they continue to be very dysfunctional. Uh, can't get the job done on most drives. Did uh, score towards the end of the game, but it was not enough and too little too late. So what are your thoughts here about the Raiders' uh, win here at home against the Browns? I called this game. Uh, I think the Raiders are the better team. Uh, I think that the Raiders have added some pieces in the draft. They have some nice pieces on defense. They're a little bit more well-rounded, and they were at home, and the Browns are a dumpster fire. So, you know, not that not that hard to explain, really. Yeah, I was really happy that Raiders got this one done. Browns, I think they're just going to have to blow it up in the offseason and just cut yep. their losses and start over. I don't think they can get rid of – Deshaun for three more years, right? So Is that they're right? just in they're just in the worst. They're in the they're paying the price for the worst contract in NFL history. Meanwhile, the Browns watch um their big man from last year come into the game, Joe Flacco, for the Colts for an injured Richardson mm -hmm. and win that ball game, play fantastic in the second half. So I wonder what Cleveland Brown fans were thinking to themselves. You know, this is the guy who got us to the playoffs last year, and we're stuck with this guy. And Flacco comes into a really tight contest with the Steelers and wins it. Interesting. Yeah. 49ers get right against the Patriots. Uh, 49ers had a, had a couple of very disappointing losses in a row. Finally play a team that they can control and, and kind of manhandle from beginning to end. Patriots just look to me like the worst team in football. They really do. Any thoughts on this one? I thought we were going to see this all season from the Niners. Uh, obviously, their injuries are dramatically affecting their performance, but I do think that they're one of the best teams in football. So they should be handling teams like the Patriots without too much question. I completely agree. It was kind of a get right game. You had Kittle come in from a couple mm -hmm. days off, a uh, couple games off, and uh, he had a beautiful a, touchdown in the end, end zone corner. Had yeah. six catches and a great catch at, there in the touchdown area. He was triple teamed on that catch in the end zone. Debo came back. Um, they're pretty much all healthy for the most part, except for Christian McCaffrey. So mm -hmm. feels like uh, if when, they can when they put it, it all together, it should be the old 49ers out there. It should be. 
So I think the game of the weekend, Vikings Packers, it felt like the pro version of Alabama Georgia, mm-hmm. with the Vikings get a humongous twenty eight to nothing lead on the Packers, and the Packers uh, finally scoring right before halftime, twenty eight seven, and then you saw that unbelievable fourth quarter they had where they almost pulled it out. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know how they did that against what I think is the best defense in football. I think partly because Jordan Love is great, and also he has a great receiving core, and he mm-hmm. was just flinging it all over the yard. But uh, this was the tale of two halves, just like Alabama-Georgia. Uh, what are your thoughts on this epic game? Packers have an incredibly good young roster. I think the Vikings are the better team, but not by much. Uh, so it's a great matchup. And sometimes the good teams get out to a big lead and then they just have to hang on. And that's that's what happened, you know. I Is think, that a concerning thing at all for the Vikings that they couldn't clamp this one down? No. It's such a great defense. Not concerning. No, I think it gives them film where they're not going to be reading their pre- press clippings about how great their defense is. Their coaches can come out and show them. Like, guys, you got abused in the fourth quarter. (laughs) Missed assignment, missed assignment. You guys missed this tackle. Uh, There's a lot of film that can be useful in improving because you don't want to be playing your best football right now. You want to be improving. You want to be getting better as the season goes on. Mm -hmm. And all the teams around you are going to start falling victim to, to injuries. You're trying to stay healthy and you're trying to be improving. If you play your best football in week four and you slide after this, you end up missing the playoffs most likely and not ever realizing your goal. So mm-hmm. they uh, they get the win, the Vikings, and they're happy with that. And then they all the coaches got plenty of material to work with on how they need to improve. So mm-hmm. I think everyone won there. That's an epic game, and I cannot wait for the next matchup, which will be in mm-hmm. Minnesota. And you know yep. the Packers are going to very much want to win that game. Yeah. So it's going to be, that's going to be exciting. Yeah. And, and, uh, love looked very rusty in the first half, almost nervous. Facing that defense was a little daunting. And I think over time, the nerves subsided and they put some good plays together and they, they brought him back from the brink. And they, I think it feels like love is back, you know? So you have that to way, think that, the loss yeah. hurts because it's in division. But I think they're very much happy with the way Love responded. You have to think Matt LaFleur is thrilled to have him back. I mean, he can make throws that Malik Willis can't, you know. So. Yeah, you don't have um, to hide Jordan Love. You have to hide Malik Willis. They probably kind of knew he'd have a little bit of a rough first half, and they were hoping they could just kind of survive it. Unfortunately, they're playing the Vikings, who are playing really high level. With Justin Jefferson and Addison and all these guys who are fantastic. Um. Just got too far behind, basically. Yeah. Um, next game, I was watching at Carolina Steel with Jeff Reed and Henry and Brenda and all the all the Steeler fans. The place was absolutely jam packed. I had no idea there were so many Steelers fans in Carolina, but mm-hmm. uh, it was really fun to watch this game. Unfortunately, uh, Steelers were leading most of the game, but um, were unable to pull this one out at the end. And Joe Flacco, like I said, had a fantastic second half in relief of Richardson who got hurt again. Um, and he looked a lot like he did last year when he took Cleveland to the playoffs unexpectedly. Uh, so the Colts can feel really good that they've got a nice backup situation there with Joe Flacco. Yeah. And I think the Colts have a really good roster, both sides of the ball and they've taken some losses, but I, I can see them, responding and, and, and improving going forward. So they're going to be a formidable team to deal with. The Steelers have a nice team. I think that Justin Fields has played really well overall. He didn't look good this week against the Colts. He did not look good, but I think, you know, it seems like their, their culture is in a good place. The Steelers, they don't strike me as a team that is, in fighting and finger pointing a lot mm-hmm. of things have gone right so far this season for them. And I do think they have one of the top defenses in football. And when your defensive leaders are a part of your winning culture, you're in a good place. So I think both teams, I completely agree. Have, 
Yeah, they're both in good place. I will say I was surprised how easily the Colts marched the ball up and down the field against the Steelers' defense, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, they really ran up a lot of yards and a lot of points. Um, that was surprising to me. And then secondly, Fields had a nice fourth quarter, but for the most part, he was pretty pedestrian most of the day. And yeah. um, I, I worry about him. I think he's solid, and I think they can win a lot of games with him, but I worry about him when he gets into the playoffs. I don't see him as being able to, you know, elevate his teammates in a really tough situation against like the Ravens or something in the playoffs. Um, we'll see, but that was my observation. I think he's in a rebuild of himself. And so even though he's not a rookie, I think you have to treat him like a rookie in terms of that whole Chicago experience was such a debacle that I think it'd be okay. They're, they're, they're building him back up from zero and they're going to have to do the same thing with Bryce Young one day. And you might have somebody respond who you can work with, or he might end up out of the league. But I think mm -hmm. Bryce Young is, is in the same kind of boat. You just start over, you let him watch and carry clipboard and learn all the tricks and learn what all these defenses are doing. And then he have a legitimate shot once all that stuff slows down a little. Mm -hmm. Right. It's a good game. These are two very good teams. I think both of them might make the wild card in the AFC. That's what I see. Um, we'll have to watch them both. I think they're both pretty solid. Next game is uh, was in a monsoon in New York in, in the Jets Stadium. Um, and one team decided to run the ball and one, one team decided not to run the ball. The Broncos ran it all day long with McLaughlin and a couple other running backs that they have. Pretty effectively, uh, Bo Nix had a very pedestrian day with 60 yards passing. How in the world he was able to win with that, I don't know. But uh, they just ran it and ran it. And because ran the it. rain takes away a lot of the passing. Yeah, somewhat. But you can still get screens and things done. I thought that they'd have a little bit more. But anyway, bottom line is the Broncos um, put on a complete clinic when it came to whipping an offensive line. We're in – uh, Aaron Rodgers face all day long. They got seven sacks. They had about 20 pressures. Uh, Rodgers had no time all day long. And when he did have time, he missed his guys or threw it out of bounds. Um, it was just an incredibly frustrating day if you're a Jets fan. And, uh, you know, really played a kind of a pedestrian uh, Broncos offense. The Jets defense, of course, is very good. Uh, what are your thoughts about this one point win by the Broncos on the road? It speaks to you and I have had many conversations about how I'm completely in favor of having inside dome stadiums for every, every team. Uh, and this is why you get these 10, nine garbage games where you do not see the best quality football and the most exciting greatest show on turf kind of things. Uh, so that's one. So they should be playing that indoors where they can make it a, a nice experience for all their their customers uh, who are in the stands, the fans. Second, you get a higher quality of football. And so that's that's an important piece here is look what happens. If that was snow, it would be the same thing, 10-9, trash. The second thing is I do think the Jets have a sneaky good defense. I think a lot of people are unaware of how good their defense is. And even though people are – Football people are aware of how good the Broncos' offensive line is. They really haven't been too too aware of the Broncos' defensive abilities, and so they were very play, impressive. They were very impressive. The Broncos' defense, good defense, plus a good offensive line, young quarterback. That's a good game plan. Keep it under control. Keep the rookie quarterback from losing the game for you. And you called it from the very beginning. The Jets' offensive line is not good. It's terrible. Yeah, it's terrible. <laughs> and so uh, is is Rodgers going to make it through this season? He's just getting absolutely abused. No, I don't think he's going to. Just like last year, I said, Tom, he's going to get hurt. And he made it four plays into the season, and he got hurt. I wasn't surprised to see that last year. I don't think the same thing's going to happen this year. Well, I that was a freak thing, though. That wasn't because of the That pressure. was a freak thing. I think he's, he's going to be nursing injuries pressure. throughout the season this this year. It's going to be different. I don't see a big season-ending injury, but I, I do think he's going to take beatings like he did limping around in this game. Um, you know, mm -hmm. it's just a terrible offensive line. 
And here's the the really big question mark. Okay, the Broncos run it all day. The Jets trying to drop back into seven step drops all day and pass the ball in in driving rain in a monsoon and, against a, a sneaky good defense. <laughs> and they have Brees Hall, who's one of the best running backs in the AFC. Yeah. I would just hand it to him 40 times. Like, what are you doing? Yep. Minimum of 30. 30 carries. I don't understand. They didn't even use him in the either. second half. <laughs> I don't either. It's just it, these young coordinators, these 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 teams have players that don't match what they're trying to do sometimes. I just I guess they and, and, and they don't want to ask Rogers to hand it off every play. But you know what? In that situation, that weather, that's the right thing to do. Yeah. Oh, I, I would do it without without even hesitation. You should know that. Yeah. But did you hear there's some dysfunction happening there? Did you hear what happened with Robert Sala at the end of the game? No. The Jets kept jumping off sides. And Robert Sala said, maybe Aaron needs to stop with the cadence. Trying to get the defense to jump off sides. Well, that's crazy because Aaron Rodgers, that's one of his biggest tools in his arsenal. Uh, is his ability. He might be the best of all time. The free at, play. At, at um, snap counts that make the defense jump off sides. And then you get Not a free just play. That, but then he gets a free play and then he throws touchdowns on him all the time. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. But can yeah. you imagine your coach is so disjointed from your quarterback that he doesn't even realize one of his biggest strengths? Right. That's right. Well, and he's a defensive guy, right? So we always talked yeah. about this. Like Darnold went to a team that has an offensive coach you know right. um no no right you, but if and you but have if you have Jaden daniels goes to a guy who used to be an offensive coach in cliff kingsbury as his coordinator it, it makes a difference right but if you're aaron Rodgers and you know that your snap counts are some of your biggest assets and your coach is saying maybe we need to eliminate that i don't know that you could get any more frustrated with that going out in the media like instead of focusing on fixing the offensive lineman jumping off sides for your cadence you're saying maybe we need to eliminate the cadence, the the uh la, the snap count confusions right right it's Absolutely. just mind-boggling well your theory about everyone should have a dome or be in a warm weather city would obviously eliminate games like this right so right you wouldn't have this situation. It would have been really interesting in that scenario if Aaron Rodgers would have won that game. Probably so. I think he would beat Bo Nix in that situation. Yeah. You're asking people to shell out $300 for a ticket to go sit in potentially last year uh, when the Dolphins got bulldozed by the, the um, Chiefs. It was 22 below zero. And literally there were some Chief fans who had to have um, limbs amputated from frostbite. That's just inexcusable. You know, it, it, there's no reason for that. It was not a good game. I mean, I hated the result, but the game itself was trash. Fans are getting limbs amputated. It just doesn't make any sense to me. You're asking these people yeah. to shell out thousands of dollars for yeah, that's right. A few family members to go see this game, right? It should be an amazing experience. I don't know. I'm warming up to it. I, I There's part of me who's old school, and I love watching the games in Buffalo where they're trying to plow through the snow and where you have the guys, you know, it's minus 10 degrees and the guys with their shirts off. And Part of me loves that, but part of me is starting to warm up to, you know, do we really need to have these trash games anymore in the NFL? I'd rather watch Vikings Packers. I'd rather watch Alabama Georgia. <laughs> yeah, Alabama Georgia. Yeah. Same. So next game is uh, Eagles and Buccaneers. The Eagles continue to struggle. They did not have A.J. Brown. They did not have Devontae Smith. Um, they all of a sudden can't run the ball because they um, aren't giving the ball to their high-powered running back very often. When they did give it to him three times in a row in the first half, uh, he ripped off a 55-yarder, and that was why they scored a touchdown in the second quarter. They just don't, in my opinion, run it with him enough either. Um and also their defense is incredibly suspect. I mean, they just got torn up all day by Baker Mayfield. Uh, this was in Tampa, but um, you really expected a much better showing by the Eagles here, even without their two top receivers. Any thoughts? 
Well, this was one of my three games I got wrong. Uh, I think the Eagles have a coaching problem. Sirianni is kind of losing the locker room. I think Jalen Hurts is too expensive, so they haven't been able to bring in some players that would help their team. Their defense has a lot of rookies on it, on rookie contracts. Not even rookies, but people on rookie contracts, so it's young. But it's also vulnerable to be taken advantage of. I think people are underestimating the Bucks. They're a very solid team with Baker Mayfield, who's playing probably top five, top six football at the quarterback position. So this shouldn't be that surprising. The Eagles have some problems, especially coaches. You know, they're telling Sirianni to stay out of all their position group meetings all week, and then you can be head coach on the weekend. Once they have once they have A.J. Brown back and they have Devontae uh, Smith back and then they have Saquon Barkley yeah. and they've got Goddard, their offense is fine. I, I think their problem is their defense is just really porous this year, yeah. and they can't stop anybody. Um, I don't know how you fix that midseason, you know? Uh, they have a lot of really high, highly recruited and highly drafted players, the Jalen Carters of the world. But uh, I, don't, I don't see it getting much better. Their DBs are not very good. We'll see. I think they're missing one or two pieces on defense, and I can't quite put my finger on it. But there's some – some they need a Rodney Harrison or somebody that's going to give them a little edge. And it seems like they just have a bunch of talented players that – Show up, play, and then I don't know. They had Hassan Reddick last year. Now he went to the Jets. You know, they're yeah, they're just, missing they're something. Lost, and lost I don't think people. their head coach is anyone who can write the ship. You know, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. So next game is my Carolina Panthers at home playing the Bengals. The Bengals that were really desperate for a win, sitting at zero and three. Bengals come into town. It was actually a really good game. Dalton played well. Uh, offensive line has played fantastic for the Panthers this year. They're now ranked number one in the NFL mm -hmm. in least uh, pressures allowed. Um, Bengals played very well. Of course, Burrow and Jamar Chase kind of went off in this game. Um, and Panthers just couldn't keep up with them in the end uh, in the scoring column. But 34-24, very pleased with the Panthers being more competitive than they were earlier in the season and all of last year. What are your thoughts on this matchup? I predicted this mostly because of the state of the Bengals. They're a pretty good 0-3 team coming in, and they're pretty desperate. You know, I think the Panthers are now, with Dalton, a pretty good team, middle of the pack maybe. And a middle of the pack team is going to struggle against a really hungry, angry team. Uh, so I'm excited that the Panthers are now going to be competitive because of their quarterback play, I think, because they have many of the other positions that you need to be decent. They can run the ball. They have some nice pieces on defense, although they certainly have had some pretty bad injuries. But I think they've addressed their offensive line, getting Hunt and uh, Iki is playing well at left tackle. So hopefully they're building something for the future. And sometimes the future is now and sometimes it's later, but. You know what? Chuba Hubbard is running well. Um, yeah. The receivers, Deontay Johnson is playing really well. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm pleased with the Panthers. Uh, their defense is their problem this year. They cannot yeah. stop anybody. Um, yeah. They're missing Luvu and. Um, Burns. Burns. Yep. It's a significant difference. They just lost Shaq Thompson for the season. They're that just, hurts. They're just not that deep. And, He's a leader uh, out there. So, yeah, but, you know, this is not a surprise. The Bengals needed a win so badly. Mm -hmm, absolutely. So next game, uh, Jaguars and Texans. Jaguars had their best game of the year so far, although they ended up going to 0-4. Texans end up pulling it out with about two minutes left in the game. The Jaguars had gone up in the third quarter. And then uh, Trevor Lawrence, who is – obviously disappointed this whole season with his $55 million a year contract, 200 million guaranteed has not played well. And in this game played relatively well until the fourth quarter, he had three drives in the fourth quarter and on all three drives missed multiple guys wide open and pretty bad misses over them, under them in the dirt. 
looked a lot like Bryce Young. And people are kind of scratching their heads. Like, what is it with this guy who had so much promise his first two years? And he's just really regressed, especially in crunch time. So what, what's your thought? I think I think the Jaguars have taken steps backward on their roster quality. I think they have more holes than they did two years ago. So the fact that they're losing a lot is not surprising to me. I think the Texans have a good team with a nice young quarterback who's really learning but still has moments. Uh, so it's not a surprise the Texans won. And Texans should be putting themselves in a position to make a playoff run. I don't think they're good enough to go deep, but they'll probably be in the playoffs for the next m many years. Several I agree years. with that. I think they're going to be competing with the Colts for that division. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. I think both of them will make the playoffs, and I think neither one of them is good enough to capture the ultimate prize. Right. But they're both so they'll just around. keep building around these young players that they have and nice trades they've made and, and et cetera, and they'll just keep adding. And everyone now is saying that Peterson has the hottest seat in the NFL and that they're wondering if they may even try something midseason, kind of an interim situation, or maybe go get Bill Belichick. Mm -hmm. He's been floated for a couple of these jobs, maybe the Eagles job or maybe the Jaguars job. We'll see, but uh, he's sitting out there, and, of course, he wants to coach again. So, If, if it's me, I think the hottest seat is Sirianni because I mm -hmm. think he's losing his locker room, and the locker room has a lot of talent in it. And so when you're the owner – and you realize this team could be making playoff runs, maybe not super deep, but definitely a playoff run, and you're losing the Buccaneers. In a bad division, Well, you might not even win your division like you, you hoped. Uh, if and, you're the Jaguars, do you really go Belichick? I don't think Bel Belichick wants to go to Jacksonville, right? He's not going to go to Jacksonville. I don't so, know. If I'm the Jaguars, I probably wait till the end of the season. You're probably going to have like a top one or two or three pick. And then I go get one of these great coordinators. You know, I go get myself a Cliff Kingsbury. I go get myself a, a Flores, one of these guys who's really doing Maybe. great this year. And uh, that's what Maybe, I Maybe, but I don't think either one of them is ideal for uh, – I was listening to an analysis on how Kingsbury is probably the best offense coordinator. But the, the knock on him was he was, was not a disciplinarian. And he was a little, little soft on the guys, and a little much, you know, little in their corner to the point where he wasn't able to hold people accountable. And on the other side of that was Flores, who was too disciplinary and wasn't able to relate to the guys, and was a little too tough on the guys in, in a lot of ways. So there's your, there's your uh, image of what an offensive and a defensive coordinator look like. Uh, if Flores could take some of the edge off and be a little more likable, he'd probably do better in some of the offensive um, rooms, like the running back room, the, the quarterback room. But he wants toughness, and you know he sued the league because they wanted him to lose, and he refused. And you know what I mean. So he's a little too much at ed edge. So I don't, I don't know that either one of them would be a great head coach. They might want to just stay at two to four million dollars a year salary, and have less pressure on, and just be a really strong coordinator in their in their lane that they excel at. Mm -hmm. To me, that might be a good thing because you've seen both of them as head coaches before, and they both didn't succeed for for the reasons I just stated. So, but you know, there's other guys. There's McDonald in in uh, Detroit. Oh, yeah. There's other guys they could go after. Oh, yeah. Uh, There's plenty of guys who haven't had their shot yet. You might want to take your shot with them. I would keep Kingsbury and pay him really well, or I would go after Flores and pay him really well and have him try and fix my defense. And I'd, mm -hmm. I'd have a head coach who's a CEO, somebody who can put it all together. And your head coach needs to bring a little bit of fear, but also be likable. And that's a special set of skills and qualities mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. not everyone has. And Reed has that in spades. Everyone likes Reed, who's, who plays for him. You never hear a bad word about him. But also, he's got a little temper and can be tough. Mm -hmm. But he's also likable. He does these commercials and he, he's, uh, he, you know, he's kind of like a tough dad that they love. They love the exactly. 
That's yeah. that's the perfect head coach. Same with yeah. Belichick. He was the same way. He was always um, – the guys love doing impressions of Belichick. You don't do an impression of somebody you don't like. You do an impression of somebody that you like but you want to make fun of. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, he was he was likable but tough. Nobody messed around with Belichick. He was always, you know, threatening to bench you, and he was always saying how the guys at the local high school could have caught that ball. Edelman, you know, just – He's mm-hmm. always doing stuff like that. So okay. next game, Commanders, Cardinals. This game was never really close. Um, the Commanders came in as a one-point favorite on the road, which was really surprising, but um, you know, kind of showing them some respect. There were a lot of people that were picking the Cardinals to win this game at home because they've been really tough even in their losses this year. They're, they're just kind of one of those tough outs that you don't really want to play, especially on the road. And they thought that uh, Jaden Daniels would have kind of a letdown game after his big game against the Bengals. And uh, just the opposite happened. He had almost a better game than the Bengal game. Uh, was 28 for 32. <laughs> I don't know how yeah. you get much better than that. And uh, they scored almost two scores in every single quarter and just won it going away and, and completely frustrated Kyler Murray. Didn't even let Kyler Murray have the ball very much. What are your thoughts about this score line and uh, – so, you know, it's so something they can keep up. So I think the Cardinals are a little better overall than they've been, but they still have some of the same problems. But the commanders are the story here. Uh, the commanders have punted four times in four games, which is unbelievable. Most of the other teams have punted 12, 14, 16 times, and they've punted four. So that means that they have incredible offensive efficiency. And provided that you're not turning the ball over a lot, which they're not, um, they are putting on a clinic in terms of offensive efficiency and playing some decent defense, holding teams, you know, getting teams off the field. So commanders are playing great. You know, they're, they're playing really well. And they're running the ball really well with Brian Robinson. They're running the ball well. I have Brian Robinson on, on my fantasy team, and I love it. Uh, and they got Austin they, Eckler, and they got a third back who's pretty good. They they're keeping the ball out of the hands of the other guy because they run it so much. And I love any team that has a good tight end, and they've not only got Ertz who's playing well, but they added Sinat, who is right. Right. A, a, a budding star for the future, and he hasn't really arrived yet, but. They've really set themselves up to have that position locked up for years. And then Jaden Daniels is a huge threat to run. So they can't, yeah. it looks like you got to spy him too. And then what happens is after you run the ball down their throats for a whole quarter, then he does play action and it actually works. Ter- yeah. Scary Terry is open. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, they're, I don't know, they're tough to play right now. Yeah. Scoring a lot of points. Provided they stay healthy and Kingsbury is allowed to do his thing, they're going to be a dangerous team for anybody to face. If they start having injuries, they don't have the depth p- potentially to over overcome that. They could topple and fall, but they're definitely building for the future. They're going to be better next year than they are this year, I imagine. And Jaden Daniels is only going to get better as long as um, the offensive line holds up and he doesn't start hearing footsteps. Still That's a little concerned you... about. It's a little concerned about their defense, but I guess we'll have to see how. They yeah, I think their defense isn't where they need it to be to to do a deep playoff run. But I am hearing people now starting to say they'll probably make a wild card game. So, well, let's talk about the last uh, game on here, and then I'm going to give you a Monday night football scores update. So, the Ravens and the Bills played last night, Sunday night football. This was a much anticipated matchup. Everyone had circled two games this week the Vikings, Packers, and the Bills, Ravens as the two mm-hmm. big games. Everyone thought this would be kind of the battle of the heavyweights. And, um, from beginning to end, the Ravens absolutely dominated, both defensively and offensively. Um, and completely frustrated Josh Allen. Wouldn't let him out of the pocket. He loves to get out and run. Um, didn't let any of his weapons uh, get going. His uh, receivers had a really bad night. There were a bunch of drops. I think they had five or six drops where he put them right in their hands. And it just was one of those nights where the Bills just couldn't get it going. So any thoughts? Mm-hmm. Well, I kind of saw this coming um, because I felt like the Bills hadn't really played anybody. And one thing I've noticed, even at the college level, when you go up a level in talent um, to play a much better team than you did last week, let's say 
our team beats a, a, a subpar team this week, but you're going to face Notre Dame next week. That jump has to happen mentally, emotionally, physically. And to go from mediocre competition up to a hard team oftentimes shows up in a 35 to 10 score. And uh, so it wasn't surprising. I think the Bills are a really good team. I wouldn't want to play them this week. I'm sure they're going to be angry. Uh, the Ravens have two superstars in addition to their quarterback. And one, you know, one of them, of course, is, is their running back, and one is their tight end. And when they're, they're able to run like they did and bust off 78-yard touchdown runs, you demoralize the other team. So I'm not surprised the Ravens did this. I don't think they're much better than the Bills, but I think the Bills were not ready for the talent level that the Ravens were bringing because I think they've had an easier time the last couple of weeks and they've gotten a little fortunate. The, the criticism first. of the Bills this year was that they've played really great and Josh Allen has probably played his best football, <laughs> but it was against – non-playoff teams and teams that are right. not really not really relevant right and now this was their first test against a really great team the ravens who really have super bowl aspirations mm -hmm. and uh they failed that test on the road in baltimore and it wasn't even that cold so well i i i even said this last week i know i would do run blitzes and stack the line and make josh allen beat me with subpar wide receivers and so that's exactly what the Ravens did. They did zone blitzes. There were no gaps for Allen to shoot out of and, and scamper for his 13-yard first downs. He gets those against all the teams that he's played so far. They were doing zone blitzes. Everyone maintained their gap, and there was no space for Allen to run. So they were hurrying his throws, mm -hmm. and they the, the run blitzes were – very effective against the run, mm -hmm. not just his running, but James Cook. And so I, that's how you stop the Bills. I, I don't think it's that hard. And then I don't think their defense is that great. So I think they can be exploited a little bit. I I think they're going to make the playoffs and because that division is not very good. But I, I don't think they're going to get out of the first round. Mm-hmm. They, we'll they gave away too much talent this year. I want to see the Bills they're play. Allen, they're asking Allen to win games by himself. I want to see the Bills play a couple more good teams. Clearly, they failed this test. I want to see them play mm -hmm. maybe two more good teams, and then we'll be able to make a decision on what their prospects are this year. Clearly, the Ravens are better right now. There's no doubt about that. One thing that's interesting, the Vikings have only been behind for three and a half minutes of this whole season. That's amazing. <laughs> That's one of the surprise teams of the year. So uh, let me give you the Monday night scores. There's two games going on right now. The first one is the Titans are leading the Dolphins 9-3. to three. Mm. Uh, Both quarterbacks have been pulled. Will Levis only threw four passes and has been pulled for Mason Rudolph, who's now playing the rest of the game for the Titans because Levis, as you know, is not impressed this year. And then uh, the Dolphins pulled – Thompson for Tyler Huntley, who was mm -hmm. with the Ra Ravens last year. So Huntley's playing right now, and he's trying to rally the Dolphins and get them some offense. Any thoughts about that game, kind of the toilet bowl? Not really. I mean, it's just they're, they're both in a bad place. They both have talented players, and they have huge glaring problems at the quarterback position. But they have other teams – uh, problems on their team as well. So these just aren't great teams. The Dolphins are not nearly as good as I thought they were going to be, even though they have really talented players. And with their running, I think their running backs being healthy would help them a lot because they'd be handing off the ball a lot more. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. now that you're down to your third string quarterback that you just got off the waivers, mm -hmm. you know that guy's not throwing the ball all over the yard, so you're going to stack the line and make the, the new guy who just arrived try to beat you. And that's not going to happen. So both it's teams are in a bad place. It's interesting. The last two passes Tyler Huntley threw, one was to Tyree Kill, and he dropped it. 
And the second one was to waddle and he dropped it. <laughs> so I wonder if, you know, just not having played with a guy, essentially you yeah. had one week of practice with him. Balls uh, coming out of his hand differently than what you're used yeah. to. And kind of lefty. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I wonder if there's mm -hmm. something to that. So the second game, um, the Lions have a 21 to 7 lead in the second quarter against the Seahawks. So the Lions are really kind of imposing their will tonight, which I think you and I both called as well. Yeah. Yeah, they're they're really good. Running the ball, passing the ball, everything. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, NFL Week 4. A lot of great games there. So Major League Baseball playoffs start actually tomorrow night, Tuesday night. You can see on the top right there, the Kansas City Royals play our Baltimore Orioles. I know the boys will be excited. Game 1 is tomorrow night. Actually, tomorrow afternoon, 4.08 p.m. Nice. And then we've got game two the next day and game three, if necessary, the next day. So by Thursday, when we do our Major League Baseball preview uh, session, we should be able to talk about some of these first-round series when we talk about it. And so definitely everybody who's listening, check out our Thursday uh, episode where we're going to talk about the Major League bracket that's coming up this week. You can see the postseason picture there. you got... Detroit playing Houston in the first round. We just mentioned Orioles, Kansas City. Whoever wins those two series will go on to play the Cleveland Guardians and the New York Yankees on the AL side. And then on the NL side, you've got uh, Milwaukee Brewers and San Diego waiting on their opponent, and then Philly and Los Angeles. you got a lot of really good teams on the NL side as well. Mm-hmm. So um, any initial thoughts about this? I know we're going to talk about this in detail on Thursday. I think we'll talk about it Thursday. It's going to be going to be exciting. This is the best time of year for baseball when it really matters. There's way too many games in baseball. The sport itself is so cool to watch, especially when the, the pressure of the playoffs starts. And it'll just be really exciting to watch the Yankees and hopefully the Orioles go at it. San Diego getting in because they had that really cool triple play. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Incredible. A lot, of, a lot of good players in there uh, make it exciting. So, I will say the Orioles, the last uh, series of the year against the Yankees, swept them. So that would look pretty good to me. Yeah, we'll uh, see. I will say the Orioles won 91 games this year when they were one of the most injured teams in baseball. And so I'm really proud of them, my team, of course, but – Proud of them that they persevered and found a way into this tournament, even with the tremendous struggles they had. They had three of their five starters in the rotation out for substantial portions of the year. They had their closer out for at least half the season. They had multiple position players out. So the fact that they were able to win 91 games. Last year they won 101 games, but they were fully healthy. So really pr proud of them. And I think a lot of these teams are going to be really exciting. And some of these series will be great. So looking forward to it. Definitely yeah, look for it. That's pretty cool. Some of the teams haven't been in there in a while. Right. Uh, yeah. You know, and so it's it's this is gonna be cool. It's gonna be good. Definitely look I for hope everybody gets to enjoy some of these games. Definitely look for our Thursday episode. We'll uh, review what games have happened this week so far, and then we'll talk about going forward. All right, let's go to our mailbag segment. This is a new segment we're adding this week, and we're gonna talk about this every single week going forward in our weekend update. So I'm gonna hand it over to Robbie. Okay, so first of all, I wanted to say something that's kind of cool. Uh, Army Navy combined are eight and zero this year. It's the first time it's happened since 1945. So tip our hat to the the uh, brave soldiers who are also football players. That's cool. Also, we want to um, say our condolences and uh, say it's kind of sad that we are have said goodbye to Dikembe Mutombo who is um, he had some health issues yeah, and I could uh, not kind of shot. I wasn't yeah. ready for that one today. So you told me um, that today and I looked at him and he was oh, 58 no, no. years old, which is only three years older than me. And I was like, Oh yeah. my goodness, what happened? He had brain cancer. Um, when I saw the Kimbe Matumbo, I went by it thinking, nah. And then I stopped and then I said, wait a second. And I looked somewhere else and I saw it. So that, that was too bad. Very sad. He was a, yeah. a very interesting character. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had his, his little shtick when he blocked your shot. So, But we got some comments here, and I'm not going to name who, who says them um, because to protect your anonymity, but uh, you may not want to have your 
attention drawn to yourself that way, but I want to encourage comments because we're going to read the good ones. Um, one of them, we'll start with our, our sport sports betting episode. Sports betting is gambling and gambling is addiction. Addiction. We as a society cannot allow multi-billion dollar sports leagues to infect people with an addiction. So that was an interesting take. Um, we certainly touched on in our episode uh, the, 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 the downside of, of uh, sports betting. So that was, uh, we appreciate that comment. It, it certainly is one aspect to consider in this whole, whole deal. Did you have any thoughts on that comment, Tom? Yeah, I think that we did talk about it. We talked about the downside. We talked about the upside. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I come down on, I'm a libertarian by nature. And if you're not hurting somebody else, then you should be free to do whatever you want to do as a citizen. That's where I come down on it, including sports betting. I like doing it myself for about $25 a bet. It's really low stakes. I think if anybody bets, they should do it within their limits and it shouldn't really impact your overall budget. Um, but I do take seriously the possibility that there's some people that shouldn't do it in our society. And those are the people with addictive personalities. So we yeah. talked pretty, pretty lengthy about some of the solutions to that in each city. And this person so, felt after our episode, this is what they still felt. So there's clearly an issue related to this um, that needs to be kind of hammered out and, and worked on. Uh, it's it's not a, a perfect formula yet. So, that's a good comment. Yeah, it's a good comment. I'll keep those coming. Um, another one, these updates keep me in the loop when I miss the games. Thanks for always keeping it real. 100. So uh, that was, I like that was that. cool. Those are good, good encouragement, but also I do think about that frequently. Um, obviously, people overseas, we get a lot of comments from overseas. We uh, do. When people are thanking us for helping them stay in the loop, it means actually more to us than you might think because that meant something to us um, growing up. And, so, and we want to be that source for people that maybe they aren't able to see some of these games and they can come to us yeah. and we can give you a really update on the games that you missed. Right. And honestly, there's no newspapers anymore. So everything's online. And if you go on ESPN, a lot of times you're just going to see what just happened. So if you missed Saturday games already by Sunday, they're they're wiping off those scores and moving on to NFL scores. It's really easy to fall behind these days because there's so much going on. So um, hopefully we can recap some of these things for you. Uh, I got one here. Jeff Reed. Let's party, man. So, I love it. Uh, yeah, so that was um, in Jeff, that was, and we did, context, we did yesterday. <laughs> that was in the context of your episode, uh, with him and with um, Armani, Armani Edwards. Mm -hmm. And you guys had a, a really cool uh episode. Um, Jeffrey's a, a real colorful character, we love having him on, on our podcast. He's a, he's a really good guy, he owns uh, Carolina Steel in Charlotte. So, go check that out. We fully support uh, what he has going on over there. I got to go over there yesterday and hang out and watch some games and watch all the Steeler fans go crazy until, of course, they lost in heartbreaking fashion to the Colts. But it was really good to see Jeff yesterday and really great to meet all those great fans. Yeah. And uh, here's the next comment. Pickleball is easy to learn. <laughs> so I was a little shocked when I read that. Uh, we had a pickleball episode. That was pretty cool. And uh, it talked about sort of the the – the rise of, of pickleball and, and how it's taken off. And so obviously this person, I would think that this comment is really not so much a criticism of pickleball, but maybe an encouragement. Hey, you can go pick up a, a paddle yeah. and, and learn how to, how to play pickleball. So yeah. I think that's where this person is coming from. Uh, we appreciate the comment and we're going to interpret it in our way of uh, encouraging people to try pickleball. I took that as anyone can play it. Anyone can have fun with it. Um, you know, yeah. this weekend we went to the beach and we played twice with your boys. Yeah. And uh, anyone at any age can play it. Anyone can enjoy it. So, yeah, that's how I took it. You're right. And it was pretty cool because the, the boys are twin eight-year-olds and they have dramatically improved over the last three times they've played. And it's really fun to watch their development. They're able to play games now instead of just trying to hit the ball back. And um, the sky's the limit when you start young. Um, but it is fun to watch um, people developing 
at such a fast rate because the game is relatively easy, but that also means that the skill level can get really, really high really quickly. And so that means the competition's all really good really quickly. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. any For other sure. thoughts on pickleball? Check out our yeah. pickleball episode. Yeah, go check it out. It was really, it was pretty good. We even uh, had a little short that came off of that episode that talks about why we think what our theories are about why the sport is growing so fast in popularity in the United States. So check that out. Yeah. Last comment is we need to up our meat game like you guys. So I, uh, I thought that was pretty funny. Um, that comment is from our 4th of July food draft that we had, which was a I funny like that. episode. That was really uh, fun. Upping our meat game, meaning uh, ribs and steak. And we had all these choices. It was a lot of fun to do that with my dad and um, my your son, my nephew. Uh, that was a fun one, uh, putting that together. We had a lot of viewership on that one, which is cool. And uh, th I thought this was a really funny comment. We need to up our meat game like you guys. I like that. So I, like I took that, that as multiple entendres. Um, I thought that was funny. And we enjoyed doing that episode. It's good. Yeah. So thank you everyone for all, for your comments. Keep them coming in. Uh, funny, funny observations or suggestions or anything like that. We love it. Tell us uh, where you are in the world, whatever you want to contribute. Uh, we welcome it. Yeah. I think you have no idea how much we love those comments. And Rob, even when he can't get to the comments, sometimes he'll call me and say, Hey, what, what are the latest comments and tell me what they are and have me read them off to him. So Please keep them coming and uh, drop us, you know, topics you want us to take on in the future. Um, so I do have one final condolence I want to just mention to the people of Western Carolina, uh, of Georgia, of Florida, of Tennessee, Tennessee, Kentucky, and everywhere else. But especially Western North Carolina, the state we're in, um, the people are really suffering. Uh, I know my dad and his wife, Julie, have been very um, affected by this, but mainly the people in the towns all around Asheville, North Carolina who have been completely wiped out in many cases, uh, lost their homes, almost 400 deaths so far and climbing. Um, and so if you have a chance to do anything to help or if you can give to the relief fund that's been started by the Red Cross, I highly encourage that you do so. Do whatever you can to try to help because these people are really suffering and they're going to um, take a long time to get back on their feet. Any thoughts about that story? Yeah, Robert? I mean, it, it's it's devastating. If you're as busy as as I am, and many of us out there are, and some of you are busier than I am. You don't have a lot of time to spend watching the news, but if you are aware of what's going on, it's pretty horrifying. Um, not only, I mean, they're finding bodies in trees. They're, it's just such a devastation that happened in this huge area. In addition to that, uh, my dad's uh, city of Asheville was completely shut down. No, no inner out roads were passable. Uh, so everything going in and out was by helicopter and plane. Um, it, it's hard to imagine this devastation that's happened, but some of the towns that we love visiting are completely leveled to the ground. There's nothing left. Um, Chimney Rock, the town, and um, Black Mountain, and some of these towns that were just such fun places to go visit. And, and Montreal. Yeah. Montreal, um, all these places have been absolutely leveled. Like there's nothing left. There's not even a house. There's nothing. So we're praying for them. Uh, we want to see us come back strong in those areas. We hope we can rebuild. Uh, hopefully the losses will, will just bring everyone more together and there'll be some positives yeah. that come out of the, this horrifying event. Um, but, you know, Things happen for a reason, and, and you, you you keep going. But let's keep them in our thoughts. Uh, wherever you are in the world, understand the suffering that's going on. And um, I know there's a lot of suffering around the world, too. But this one hits home for us. So we just wanted to say something about that. Super cool that our friend Brad Moore, who's a friend of the show, uh, his son is a kicker for App State. He's been on the show, um, sent us over a story that the App State football team, who had a day off today and, and are not training, for their next game, took the day uh, that they had off and went and tried to help people and dig people out and 
and shovel and uh, just help people as much as they could serve soup kitchens and just do some great things for people. And the fact that those young men decided to do that, that just says a lot about them. And also I'm, I'm hearing stories about people from all, all over the East coast and they're flying in some of them own their own planes and everything. They're flying in supplies into the airport and then passing them off to the red cross and then flying back out again. So there's this big relief effort going on and they've actually been able to open up two roads into Asheville recently, but there's so many areas that are devastated in Tennessee and, and many others that it's going to take a decade probably to rebuild. So, and then all those lost families, there's no way to rebuild. You just, you just try to move forward. We'll keep them in our prayers, and uh, we're going to go watch some Monday Night Football now and uh, no, to another great football week coming up. Really excited about it, and uh, look out for our episode Thursday night about Major League Baseball playoffs, and uh, we got a lot of good stuff coming your way. So definitely like this video and subscribe to the channel, and uh, sports guys, we'll see you next time. And remember Good. to up your meat game. <laughs> That's right. Have a good night. See you.